My name is Namrata Goswami, and I teach at the Thunderbird School of Global Management, Arizona State University. And I also authored a book called Scramble for the Skies, The Great Power Competition to Control the Resources of Outer Space. So during the Cold War, the US, China, and India were basically strategically in an alignment position that sometimes seemed competing. So the US, of course, was very much geared towards using its space program to counter the Soviet Union that collapsed in 1991. India was more in terms of a non-aligned kind of uh, country in terms of space. And China was basically strategically looking for convergence with the United States after the Nixon visit. Today, when you look at the roles of China, India, and the US, they all want to play leadership role. So the US wants to remain the primary actor in terms of space policy and programs. And it wants to utilize its public private partnership to build that particular capability, especially for democratic outcomes in space. For China, what is fascinating is that China wants to actually pull the space narrative from just being about Earth to making it a lot about, for example, space resource utilization, like resources on the moon, having one of the most advanced space program, which is very interesting for space policy because it challenges the traditional discourse of space being all about Earth and Earth communication and navigation. So I find that exciting about China's space program and it's leading the narrative in that regard. And finally, for India, what India has done in the last few years and months is to showcase capability to not just be able to send satellites, but to soft land on the lunar uh, southern hemisphere, as well as starting to align more with the United States in, in terms of its space program. So for example, India signed the Artemis Accords, as you know, that is initiated by the US for lunar governance structures in June of this year, and has now signed a human space flight program with the US. So India sees its role as leading nation, but not as a great power yet. I think the one lesson that the US can learn in terms of, for example, India and China space program is that both nations are viewing space from an economic perspective. So the US space program has economic perspectives, but it's a lot about exploration, science, and national security space capability. So it is very much still dictated by what the US achieved during the Cold War, including missions like sending humans back to the moon again, like the Apollo mission. So it's not so much about permanent economic capability, sustainable development, for example, of the moon. So what China has done, as I mentioned before, is that China has actually created a discourse where it's building capabilities like space-based solar power. That is a renewable technology that is going to effort humanity a very low cost accessible energy that is going to be 24 hours. So sunlight uh, gathered in space where it is 24 hours, unlike Earth where ground solar has challenges of weather uh, and night. So that's really an interesting learning lesson for the US that nations like China and India are changing. Now what China and India can learn from the US is the fact that the US remains the lead actor in terms of space capability because of its innovative industrial base. So the US is the first nation to push for private space companies, the first nation to develop reusable capability, also the first nation to unleash private entrepreneurship. So both China and India have learned a lesson and have instituted policy to develop their private space capacity, but they are not there yet. So that's a lesson that China and India can take from the US. So transparency was a issue during the Cold War. So nations were more secretive in terms of their internal institutional capacity building, while they were pretty transparent about what they achieved, right? Because it was a rivalry as to which uh, ideological bloc will emerge victorious, right? Will it be US or will it be the Soviet Union? Now, what is interesting is that India, as I had mentioned in my article, historically has been very secretive, the Indian Space Research Organization. So while it launched very low cost missions, the communication to the public was very, not very transparent as to what these missions were about, 
What is the capability? Because capability in space is a big deal. What are you actually doing in terms of propulsion system, in terms of resource uh, exploration? What is it, right? So what I found so interesting was that, as I mentioned in my article uh, where I was quoted actually, uh, is that the Chandrayaan-3 mission actually astounded me too. Because during my field work, I still felt that there was this reticence to talk about space missions. But with the Chandrayaan-3, India's space research organization, ISRO, was so transparent as to what the mission goal was, what the rover was going to do, real-time data on what the rover actually was doing on the moon, and also in terms of what Chandrayaan-3 means in terms of space capability, right? I think the realization came because of the fact that the US space community, as well as China, were very transparent in terms of their space missions, right? So people argue that China's space mission is not transparent. It's very difficult to get data. I completely contradict that argument because of my own experience, right? Or counter it, if I may, is because when I traveled to China and did field work, I was very actually surprised and happy to see that in my interviews, space scientists and policymakers were pretty transparent as to what their space programs were about. China publishes a white paper on its space activities. It also is very good in giving interviews as to what their space program is about. And it also shared data as to what its Chang'e 4 was doing on the moon, right? Including through uh, Twitter that is known as X today, right? So I think there are these learning lessons. And also, finally, I'll say that the Indian decision to be transparent <clears throat> is also connected to the realization that space capability adds to its status and prestige. And today the world is different. Social media plays a really big role, right? In terms of informing even the younger generations thinking about where nations are. So I think all that factored in into India's decision to be more transparent. So will the future space order be more competitive or will we see collaboration? Because historically we have seen collaboration between the US and the Soviet Union, including at the time when their conflict escalatory ladder was pretty high, right? So I think the one thing that helped the US and the Soviet Union to collaborate and people forget this was that they initiated a strategy called detente, right? So detente basically helped because both nations took a decision that it's really critical for them to de-escalate and to have communication and collaboration. I do not see a very similar strategic structural level policy between the US and China yet, but that does not mean that that might not happen because space technology is such that collaborative efforts help, right? In terms of where they go. Now, in regard to the Wolf Amendment to answer your question, the basic premise of the Wolf Amendment was that there were concerns as to how China organized its institutions, for example, in space. So unlike the US and India, where there is a very clear demarcation between the military and the civilian aspects of their space program, and that really matters because if you want to collaborate in high-end technology, one concern that nations have is that such technology should not fall into becoming militarized, right? And so the Wolf Amendment's argument was that US advanced space technology could fall into China's missile development program, right? And so for China, there is a civil military fusion strategy today and President Xi Jinping has actually uh, basically argued that that leads to Chinese advantage. And that also becomes an obstacle to US-China collaboration in space, right? And so the Wolf Amendment, that's why I think it'll be very hard to remove it unless China is very clear as to what its uh, civil and military space institutions are and does this very clear demarcation, right? So an example from history, recent history is India-US nuclear collaboration, right? The US's biggest concern about India's nuclear program was very similar, that India's nuclear civilian technology might fall into the hand of its weaponization program. So what India did was that it very clearly demarcated both programs and that resulted in closer US-India nuclear collaboration.
Now, if you the answer your question about China, India space collaboration, multilaterally, there are lots of efforts, for example, to the BRICS summit, where they talked about building uh, space collaborative efforts together. And then you saw the G20 summit, where again, space and science and technology were a critical part of the joint statement. And China is a member of both. But I think Unfortunately, because India and China suffer from disputed territories and conflict at the border, and space plays a role in terms of intelligence, reconnaissance, surveillance, and both countries are anti-satellite weapon states, the collaboration is not at the level that should be for ideally for two major spacefaring nations in Asia. And I actually come from one of the conflict affected areas, uh, which is Northeast India, where the disputed uh, territories are. And there is a lot of concern from the local population that this particular territorial issue can escalate, right? And there is pressure on Indian policymakers to make it more uh, basically defend the territory. So that can limit uh, space collaboration between India and China. Unless they resolve the border and territorial issue, that has an impact on their larger relationship as well. One of the biggest uh, pulling factor for the Chandrayaan-3 mission, and in fact, in interviews after the mission, almost every media outlet wanted to understand how the mission was so uh, effective in terms of keeping down costs, about $75 million. A single launch of the space launch system by NASA is $4 billion, right? It's a huge, India was not, India's Chandrayaan-3 was launch, which is the rocket, uh, the propulsion system, the entire Chandrayaan-3 mission, the rover and the lander, which is very, very efficient, right? So uh, I think what we see uh, moving forward to answer your question is that you already see strategic collaboration between the US and India, right? So in a joint statement signed during Prime Minister Modi's visit to the US and then President Biden's visit to India during the G20 summit, both nations have taken the decision to collaborate in space. And there are three critical levels of collaboration. One is to build the human spaceflight program. Second is to encourage India's own private sector to collaborate with NASA's commercial lunar payload service. So basically to be able to develop capability to go to the moon together. And then finally, India and the US are going to the International Space Station next year. So it'll be the first Indian astronauts that will go to the ISS, which is a big deal, right? now. When it comes to collaboration, as I mentioned, between the three nations, which is China, India, and the US, the current climate does not seem to support it, right? And as was mentioned, uh, there are reasons for this. One is, of course, the great fear within the United States that supply chain mechanisms are becoming very dominated by China. There is lack of understanding as to where China as a nation identifies itself. Uh, also, there are attitudes that were, so it's interesting. So why do US policymakers behave this way? So it'll be interesting to your audience to understand that when it comes to American attitudes towards China, there is a shift that is happening, right? And this has been uh, sampled by Pew Research Surveys. So if you look at Pew Research Surveys in the last few years, especially after President Xi Jinping uh, took over as president in 2013, the American populace, at least those polled, uh, basically views China's activities, for example, in the South China Sea, building of artificial islands, in regard to its posture with Taiwan, uh, in regard to its posture, in regard to space as uh, concerning, to put it mildly, right? And so what happens is that that translates to policymakers then getting bipartisan consensus because they're reflecting back those views as well, right? So uh, how do you deconstruct that by having a much more transparent dialogue as to where both nations are going? So their, their collaboration becomes very difficult to sustain, right? And then with India and China and the US, you can see that there is a, a competition going on. So India has joined the Artemis initiated program. Uh, China has been critical of the Artemis initiated program and has developed its own international lunar research station where Russia, Pakistan, South Africa, Venezuela are members. So given that situation, it seems like they are competing 
in terms of where they're going in space instead of collaborating, which actually would be much more sustainable in the long run, right? Because competition can only become this much. And the concern is that it shouldn't escalate into conflict. Yeah, so I think I would see the challenges from three aspects. So one is at the level of policy and legislation, right? So the Wolf Amendment is a challenge because it does not allow uh, direct space collaboration between the space uh, institutions of China and the U.S., right? Uh, NASA cannot collaborate with the China National Space Administration. But interestingly, multilaterally, they can have dialogue and conversation, as they did in the International Astronautical Union. And so that's a challenge. Uh, the second challenge is in terms of space capacity and issues like space traffic management and space debris management. So we all know that outer space will see a lot more satellite constellations in the next few years, uh, including from China that has registered about 13,000 satellites with the International Telecommunication Union and SpaceX with 40,000 satellites, right? India is also planning to launch a national constellation. This makes low Earth orbit very crowded, and especially when you have defunct satellites that become space debris. So one of the biggest challenges is how do you have consensus as to how are you going to clean up space and what is close approach? So what happens if a particular space body registered to a particular nation comes very close to another space body registered with another nation? There is no consensus, right? And that's a challenge. So how do you get to consensus? And the, between the three major spacefaring nations, I would think that there has to be some level of consensus as to how do they deal with these particular issues. And then finally, I think one of the biggest challenges for all three nations, US, China, and India, are that they are both major military space nations, right? So both, all three nations have taken decisions that space is a very critical part of military power projection, uh, including building anti-satellite weapons, uh, also co-orbital satellite platforms that can have robotic arms that can actually act as a weapon in the future. So because of this, because of these concerns and fears, I think the relationship has challenges, and this is connected to, for example, disputes in Taiwan, disputes in the South China Sea, disputes with Japan, and disputes with India at the border. So all three nations have to tackle with these challenges as well.